this uh, session was um, mostly in a research direction where if you are really interested in working on blockchains there are many areas that we can explore into uh, to work on uh, um, blockchains yesterday we have seen about permission blockchains and you know when you look at the scope of them we can we always look them from an application orientation where we can apply these blockchains in various aspects or various applications but then comes the next step right when you are trying to apply it uh, to generate a framework uh, use a particular blockchain either a public blockchain like ethereum or a permission blockchain like hyperledger fabric or r3 or coda there are many uh, challenges that uh, we need to face or we need to work on while you are trying to customize it to a particular application you know theoretically it looks so fascinating to hear that it is transparent immutable decentralized peer to peer but when you keep your hands on to the framework and start working it on an application there are many aspects that we need to focus on that we need to you know um, keep, uh, keep more uh, um, concentration on those issues to ensure that the respective application works smoothly so uh, th this is my talk where uh, uh, this is the outline of my talk with, uh, there are certain aspects considering the time and all i'll be skipping them a uh, few things like building blocks and all which you have already seen uh, we look into the blockchain architecture we need to look into it more uh, in a um, i'm not sure if it, the architecture were discussed ever but uh, to get an idea on what are those areas that we need to look into or that we need to focus on when you are trying to do these applications we need to have an idea on the architecture the types of the blockchains we have already seen so i'll skip that consensus algorithm i'm sure you have a session tomorrow on that i'll also skip that but i'll focus more on the last things like what are the challenges in blockchain with respect to various applications the security and privacy issues what are the solutions that are there already in literature and what more do we need on uh, with them is what we'll be looking into these are the five building blocks for um, um, you know blockchains where they are based on hash functions digital signatures public infrastructure merkle tree and consensus you either take permission or public blockchains more or less the building blocks do not change and i'm not going to tell you about uh, the respective building blocks i expect that they have been covered by uh, the time you enter into the third day or fourth day of the session but then i'll bring your focus here to the architecture if you there are many architectures proposed by many papers many others on how you look at the blockchain and uh, how you look uh, what is your perspective when you start looking into the architecture this is some uh, architecture that i can relate very much uh, because you know the various components that we have studied across this entire workshop you can fit them in one or the other layer so there is this data layer where you have various blocks of data which are connected by hash functions with this linkedl structure there is a merkle tree on which uh, all the uh, blocks hashed blocks are connected a timestamp and a digital signature there is little for us to work on this day i am talking on a research, research perspective so very little for us to work on this data layer because uh, uh, most of the things are existing hash functions signatures are there from um, uh, since a long very long time so um, you know uh, uh, we can use any hash function which fits into our bill uh, and we can use it, use it so comes the next layer network layer we all know that blockchains is based on peer to peer network and it uses protocols like transmission protocol gossip protocol to propagate various blocks and all and a verification mechanism there is some scope on how your um, transactions are verified will be uh, there is a little scope to work on this but uh, i don't um, work much on that as i am not from networks then comes the consensus layer lot of work is going on in these areas proof of work is something that is already established 
but we all know the disadvantage of proof of work i'm not sure if it was uh, discussed or not but i'm sure it will be discussed in tomorrow's uh, consensus session so proof of work is that uh, algorithm where uh, people come to consensus uh, in a bitcoin blockchain network but the problem with proof of work is that lot of resources are wasted in computing that single nonce uh to respond to the challenge given by the system and you know there is lot of disadvantage that was happening to the environment the lot of power consumption was um, happening if you see china which is a very strong mining pool which has a very strong mining pool because of the excessive mining that they are doing in they are leaving lot of carbon footprints onto the world so people started moving on to other consensus layers like proof of stake uh, delegated proof of stake uh, byzantine fault tolerant uh, proof of work proof of burn proof of elapsed time there are a lot of consensus algorithms are there where the trade off is to ensure the consensus is received uh, in, a, in in the best way possible with little uh, with little usage of resources so and also when it comes to consensus mechanisms there are two categories that we look into where some consensus algorithms are used in open environments like permissionless blockchains and some consensus are used in closed environments something like a state machine replication algorithms which are based on majority and voting mechanisms so there is some scope for people who are interested in working blockchains they can look into various consensus algorithms then comes incentive layers incentive layer is that layer which is mostly used in public blockchains where uh, they have some currency issue mechanism how to issue currency how to distribute the currency if you look in blo uh, blockchain bitcoin blockchain um, bitcoins is a currency that was issued block reward is some coins how it was distributed what are the conditions and all these things this generally uh, is a strategic measure on how you look into your application so um, the more distributed the more open it is um, uh, issue mechanism and all the things will work on but if you look at permissionless blockchains um, uh, it is an optional thing that we look into the more, the next layer is the contract layer where as i told you that right now apart from bitcoin blockchain any blockchain that you take into it works on uh, smart contracts so how do you write smart contract how what are the mechanisms that you implement uh, to embed smart contract into your blockchain uh, the various uh, programming languages uh, to write smart contracts solidity is a very popular programming language to write smart contracts on ethereum now you can write smart contracts using uh, python javascript as well uh, so a lot of work is going on to improve the efficiency of the smart contracts to ensure smart contracts are executed with a bug free environment and all these things then comes the application layer which we have already discussed in the last session on where to uh, ap uh, apply this blockchain framework in which application in a finance application in iot uh, name any area you will have this respective thing then this is another way on how you emphasize or how you look your architecture uh, to keep it very simple rather than so many layers this is uh, proposed by one more other in one of his paper where we basically look at it in three layers one is a network layer one is a ledger layer and the other is application layer so for every blockchain you name any blockchain ethereum blockchain bitcoin blockchain hyperledger permissionless permission consortium any blockchain that you like that comes in the application layer on how you customize it but below that the two layers are the same how you implement that peer to peer decentralized network and how you manage your global ledger it would be the same the how the various blocks of the blockchain are connected and all the things you want to bitcoin uh, you want to have a bitcoin application yeah that application layer is what that changes but apart from this this p to p and global ledger are the same the only thing that differs here is that all the applications will have smart contracts except that in bitcoin it is coupled along with the ledger the transactions that happen within the 
um, uh, Bitcoin network are the only smart contracts. Beyond cryptocurrency transactions, you don't have the flexibility to execute your own transactions in Bitcoin blockchain. All other blockchains allow smart contracts. You can write your code, deploy it on the uh, EVM uh, on the respective blockchain and start executing it. So this is a transaction process uh, which you have probably gone through. We'll just skip this part. So these are those characteristics of blockchain that we try to achieve irrespective of uh, where you apply your blockchain. You need to come away from that conventional transaction system where there will be a centralized server or a centralized hierarchy sitting on top of you and saying you are allowed to do these transactions, you are allowed to do these transactions or any transaction that you do happens through that so-called centralized person or so-called trusted third party. We do any transaction, we use some, uh, we do those uh, transactions through some uh, what you call through some bank. So I, I do a transaction through SBI, I do a transaction through ICICI, I, I do a transaction through HDFC and those are the people who will be, uh, uh, you know, posing rules and regulations on what can be possible, what cannot be possible, who to, with whom I can transact, with whom I cannot transact, what are those transaction charges and all these things. We move away from that, we come to a completely decentralized system, we come to pay to pay transaction system. So I can transact with anyone in this world, I can send money to any person in the world, I can receive money to, uh, from any person in the world. Sounds really fascinating, isn't it? But are there any concerns when we look into a pay to pay transaction system? Look at this way, you did a transaction and the transaction failed, whom did you reach? How are you going to trace back your transaction? How do you know, uh, suppose say if your transaction is pending in the sense that transaction is not confirmed, how do you know the status of the transaction? Suppose say your transaction failed, but the money was uh, debited from your account, how, whom do you reach to get back to that? There are mechanisms in conventional transaction system to do that, but in a peer-to-peer -peer transaction system where every peer node has the same say, amount of access and all, uh, to whom are you going to reach? How are you going to get back to the things? Are you sure that your transaction gets committed? Or are you sure your transaction completes um, definitely? All such uh, question marks do arise when we, uh, uh, when we enter into this P2P transaction system. I didn't mean to scare you or I didn't mean to demotivate you from going to a P2P transaction system, but obviously these are certain things that such things will always be there when you, um, you know, when there is a shift from one platform to another platform. The only thing is that how carefully do we address them, how um, efficiently do we address them will ensure the longevity of the respect to uh, the platform. Then um, persistency for blockchains is about the immutable distributed ledger. No transaction can be tampered. It is nearly impossible to transfer, uh, tamper any transaction. That sounds so nice to me because see, any transaction that was uh, recorded on the blockchain, nobody will be able to forge your transactions. Nobody will be able to delete your transactions or modify your transactions. Sounds good, but what happens if you yourself do not want a transaction to be there on the data bus, on the database? I uh, imagine, imagine every single thing getting recorded on the database. See, blockchain is something which is telling you, yes, everything is there, everything will be available. But are you really sure? This is not only about currency transfer, money transfer or things. See, you do, uh, suppose say your organization has implemented a blockchain and everything gets record, uh, recorded, everything will be there on the, what you call, 
uh, everything will be there as a transaction on your blockchain do you really think do you appreciate that idea uh, that everything is recorded or something uh, gets uh, uh, recorded in a wrong way or in a twisted way you want to change it you can't change it rather you can go for a new transaction and say that transaction was modified into this one the current databases allow you to add modify delete your databases whereas blockchain do not allow you with all these options what all you can do is only append the database so add 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 is the only thing that you can do and view and verify your transactions so although it is very nice to hear it is nearly impossible to tamper any transaction what if you yourself wants to uh modify your transaction uh, what if you yourself do not want your transaction to be kept in the database you don't have a choice so how do you look into it then comes the anonymity so user interacts with the blockchain with a public key address generally these public private key address are maintained as user credentials on the user's wallet on the app that he downloads you have a ethereum app you have a so uh, not ethereum app for example if you want ethereum blockchain you use metamask wallet so that wallet contains your public key private key and all the your balance number of ethers that you maintain and all right so the beauty as of now that blockchain has been telling you is that you are anonymous to the blockchain people do not know you physically what is your name what is your designation where do you stay no people do not know any user will not be knowing them uh, in a blockchain scenario what is it that they are associated with is they are associated with your public key address so uh, there are uh, this is a double edged sword if you ask me so what happens is that you go you register yourself in any portal of any other thing you register yourself in amazon you register yourself in facebook you register yourself in instagram there is a profile pic there is a name there is an email id associated probably for more formal applications they may ask you to give your pan number or other number for your physical identification and you are identified by those numbers by those cards by those things that are there associated but in a blockchain how are you identified i give you a 160 bit digit uh, uh, public key address and you say you identify me with this address people doesn't know anything about you except for that 160 bit address so what is the good part about that the good part about that is if i want to do anonymous transactions this is the best bet right you can always do uh, do transactions in blockchain nobody doesn't uh, really doesn't want to know who you are and all good what is the evil part or the bad part about that the bad part about is that not only the transactions that you have done the transactions that are not supposed to happen something related to terrorist activities something related to drugs consumption something related to uh, what you call uh, uh, illegal activities all these things also do happen in public key address because uh, sorry all these happen in blockchain scenarios because people do not have a mechanism to identify who the user is and if you know uh, if you know the uh what uh, what you call there is a, a uh, underground uh, um uh, activities that are happening using these uh, bitcoins in fact silk road is a very anonymous international online marketplace and you know what are those top 10 uh, activities or top 10 items that gets available on silk road where you can buy them using bitcoins they are uh, uh, uh i'll just read out a few names some of them are drugs some of them are cocaine pills um, weeds and then yeah there are also books there are also uh, you know uh, hash values uh, with certain constraints and all but you know among 10 things there are two or three useful things and the remaining seven are something which are not good for us for our own society then do you encourage transactions such transactions on blockchain right that is the reason in fact even indian government is um, 
not acting really fast on uh, legalizing blockchains because if such things happen india being such a vast country it is definitely not possible to control uh, such uh, things arms weapon uh, weapons buying and uh, selling all these illegal activities can happen easily when your address is masked however despite all these things the beauty is that although blockchain claims that you can do transactions using anonymous addresses there is no guarantee on perfect privacy preservation there are mechanisms that we will look into them in the coming slides mechanisms where you can de anonymize the respective address how do you do that we have mechanisms available already in literature statistical techniques available they are relatively complex they are relatively tedious things to do but on the first step do you really want to do them then comes auditability auditability is mainly to maintain transparent transactions because any transaction that you do will be associated with a digital stamp and it is uh, impossible to erase or edit that particular di digital stamp i'll skip this part types of blockchain already we have seen and the consensus algorithm i'll leave it for tomorrow's session i'll come to our topic what are those areas that we look into so applications of blockchain where when you want to apply in blockchain it can be applied in many areas such as finance finance uh, in, includes uh, many things you know banking is one thing trade market shares and all is another industry where people are trying to implement blockchain why to have transparency to have immutable transactions and all iot many ngos are implementing blockchains um, to to publish their work uh, to get expose themselves to every corner of the world and get more funds to ensure that their ngo is more transparent in the sense every transaction that happens to ngo is recorded on the blockchain anybody can verify that that way the transparency of the ngo increases they buy probably people will come forward more to donate or probably to assist in the functioning of the respective services healthcare healthcare is all together as of now to my knowledge the biggest domain uh, in along with iot where blockchain is being uh, addressed because see uh we need uh, uh, such uh, uh, such scenarios or such uh, use cases where we can apply blockchain we go to a hospital for some medical ailment we get a prescription we do medication we come back then uh, probably we go to a different city for a different purpose again we we are stuck with some other medical ailment again we go to a doctor we get a prescription how many of us are uh, filing all these prescriptions how where is your patient data if you look here, if you look now uh, we uh, humans as it is uh, we don't have the tendency to file all the prescriptions even if we file them and take them to the doctor doctor don't have the you know um, time or uh, leisure to go through all your prescriptions uh, that you have there okay right now the corporate hospitals have gone to the next level the second step you know you tell your id or probably your mobile number all the doctor visits all your doc patient data is maintained at one single thing but the problem again here is that you go to a particular hospital your data is maintained in that hospital assuming it is a multi speciality hospital you go to a cardiologist you go to a orthopedic you go to a general physician you go to a some other doctor all this data will be maintained once you change your hospital again you are back to square one healthcare is that particular scenario where your data can be kept on the blockchain uh, where people across the um, across the hospitals or across the states or across the countries can access your blockchain assuming all of them are connected in the blockchain but again the problem is that medical data is supposed to be really sensitive data i don't want to 
publish all the all my medical data onto a public blockchain where everyone has access who can have access may not be other people may not have access but doctors can have access diagnostics can have access uh, probably a, a nutritionist can have access different set of people will have access and considering the privacy between a doctor and patient we need to take at most care in ensuring that our data is there on the blockchain but preserved to the maximum extent right so voting people are uh, coming up with many voting applications if you see ethereum already have a voting app where uh, voting happens in a blockchain uh, insurance is another thing to maintain more uh, more uh, transparency identity management all these things are various applications of blockchain the only scenario is that different applications have different security issues ap apart from the more generic issues so let us see uh, the focus of our talk where uh, we will be looking into what are those uh, challenges that blockchain faces what are those uh, issues that blockchain faces and what are the solutions that are there in literature already or do we can we work a little more on that these are the major challenges that uh, blockchain is facing as of now um, uh, i don't say these are the only issues i say these are the major issues one is scalability selfish mining energy consumption interoperability security and privacy is another major area which will take it as it is as one major area uh, that is my area of interest that that is the reason i'll be focusing more on security and privacy issues but apart from that let us see the other uh, issues also when it comes to scalability the bitcoin block size as of now is 1 mb so they started keep on adding 1 mb of block size blockchains and now your blockchain has uh, almost exceeded to 69 269 is not the number now it is about to 80 plus gb right so uh, what is your maximum limit when you start keeping adding more and more amount of things uh, Uh, how are you going to parse the transactions in such a huge storage because you have such a huge storage the and the number of users are also very large in public blockchains the mining time takes very long right now the mining time was about 10 minutes considering the huge uh, fpgas that we use for mining and you look at any regular commercial uh, networks that are used in financial industry they do around uh, transactions of seven transactions per second okay so when when we want to deal with high frequency trading bitcoin blockchain was lacking in that and uh, there is always a trade off between block size and speed the larger the block size definitely the speed comes down what happens as a reason is that if you look into bitcoin blockchain how do you do every every node propagates various blocks uh, sorry various transactions and the miners who are there in the network they collect all these transactions and then once some set of transactions are there with them which can be fitted in a in a block they keep those transactions pack them hash them create the header and then start mining for that particular block but how do you what do you think what is the criteria used by the miners to keep the transactions into the block it is not a first come first serve scenario generally why are miners interested in mining these transactions or mining the blocks is that they will get a reward if the mining block was accepted apart from the reward what is it that they'll get is what all the transaction fees that are there in the transactions of that particular block will be their money so that is the incentive that they get when they do mining as a result what happens generally miners keep those transactions which have high transaction fee in their block because if their block gets mined all that high transaction fee will be theirs that is the reward they get so in this whole uh, race of mining uh, collecting high transaction fee transactions and all these things the small transactions will get delayed and the delay can be forever if your mining is taking lot of time 
So scalability is an issue when you have large block sizes. What are the solutions that we have in so uh, in um, in literature with respect to scal scalability is that uh, you store um, an optimized version of blockchain where you don't store every transaction and all the things. What you have is that the old records are removed by the network. It doesn't mean they are eliminated. They are removed by the network and maintained in a different server. But what is it the current database holds is only the balance of the all the addresses. We trust in that uh, uh, optimization. So what we have, uh, what we call those things is that we call something known as lightweight clients. These lightweight clients, what they do, they only hold the balance of the addresses whenever they want to verify the transactions that expensive computations are outsourced to some multiple, some servers. So there will be some set of multiple servers and uh, when a particular computation was given to them, they give this computation to multiple servers and if all the servers give the same result or majority of the servers give the same result, they go by that particular value. The other um, um, uh, solution that literature have is uh, lightning networks. What are lightning networks is that lightning networks are those networks where um, they act as a layer to your blockchain. Uh, where a uh, majority of the transactions happen offline and the final deal is made as a transaction in the online of the blockchain so that you can avoid a lot of uh, communication overhead in the blockchain. That is one possible scenario, lightning networks, lightweight clients by optimizing your storage values. The other scenario is that uh, redesign the entire blockchain. How do I redesign? Uh, you divide your blockchain into two parts where you have one for a leader election and the another to store the transactions. So you call that first block as key block and the second one as micro block. Key block is for leader election, micro block is for storing the transactions. Basically key block is for mining thing. So the miners compete to become a leader and once the leader is elected, he will be becoming responsible for a micro block generation. <laughs> and, in, and this leader is not like our leaders who stay for a long time. As soon as the block was completed, then a new miner can be the next leader for the next block. It depends on his mining powers. That is about scalability. So another challenge in blockchain is selfish mining. This is the reason why blockchains are um, really not trusted by many government authorities or many uh, many people uh, who, who have idea on blockchains. What is this uh, selfish mining is that there are some set of miners who try to achieve more than their fair share. Let us talk about fair share first. What is fair share? Fair share is that if I start mining a block and if my block gets rewarded in the sense if my block gets mined, I'm able to provide that nonce, I'm able to give my proof of work. I will be rewarded with a block of uh, right now Bitcoin is giving around 6.25 Bitcoins when your block is mined. So that is a, re uh, a reward that I get. Apart from that reward, I get the transaction fee of all the transactions in my block as a reward for me because I mined that block and I help those transactions to get committed on the blockchain. So that is my fair share that my block reward and the transaction fees of the transactions of my block as, is my fair share. But these people, selfish miners as the name says, they try to achieve larger revenue. How do they do this is that uh, you all know that in a blockchain, what is that chain that is acceptable is that that chain which is longest in the blockchain will be accepted. The others are merely called as forks and you uh, discard them after some point of time. So what do these selfish miners do is that they keep their mind blocks without broadcasting. Generally what happens after I mine my block, I broadcast it to the entire network. And uh, the entire network will verify it and then it will be added to the blockchain. These selfish miners, they will not broadcast it to the entire network. They will only broadcast it or they will only propagate it to the subset of the network. 
so they keep adding more blocks to that particular blockchain only few people are working on that chain so um, mining time will also be very less they will be able to do the mining faster and then they'll keep adding blocks to this so called private branch so what happens if they add uh, blocks to the private branch after certain amount of time after certain point of time what happens is that this private branch becomes longer than the public chain that is available open to all the nodes in the network so what happens then they will publicize this private chain saying since this chain is longer than the current public chain we will make this chain as public or official from now on so what happens that is also a chain that is also validated transactions and all but what will happen here what is the disadvantage that happen here is that honest miners who will be mining on the public chain they will waste their resources on a useless branch because eventually it is going to be discarded they don't know that because they are not selfish miners they are honest miners they start working on a publicly available chain they keep invest so much amount of resources on the and eventually all their resources go to a wastage because it is another chain that gets official after certain point of mine and uh, selfish miners are mining the private chain without competitors whereas the honest miners are uh, battling their race in an open environment and finally what happens what happens after this public chain becomes official the rational miners or the honest miners also get attracted to this selfish pool and it could exceed 51% power quickly so as of now uh, the talk is that bitcoin is already having a pool of 40% miners as one single pool if it becomes 51% they can easily make many changes in the blockchain they can reverse the transactions they can modify the transactions they can do anything which as of now we are thinking blockchain will not allow or will not permit as a result that will stop the blockchain development it hinders the blockchain development and these nodes with 51% computing power could reverse any transaction or the whole blockchain as it is so what can we do for this for what can how can we stop this selfish mining can't we stop selfish mining or can't we avoid uh, the chances of selfish mining to happen there are a few things that were introduced at a later point of time which was stopping the selfish mining to certain extent but not completely one is by introducing random values and time stamps in the transactions so what happens is that when they introduce time stamps into the block the honest miners will select those fresh blocks but time stamps are always forgeable in literature you can always forge a time stamp there are techniques on how to do it so to certain extent this uh, time stamps are helping the honest miners to choose the fresh block as far as possible so even if the chain was kept private because it has a very fresh time stamp and those uh, blocks which are already available on public blockchain will have old time stamps that will discourage honest miners to use those old blocks and thereby they can save their resources but if the miners can forge the time stamps we can't do anything and there are mechanisms to do to forge your time stamps and the other thing that they have introduced other constraint that they have introduced is that each block must be generated and accepted by the network within a maximum time interval so you say you provide this blockchain saying that we have we are working on this blockchain some uh, two weeks back yeah blockchain is not going to allow such things so your block if it was generated must be accepted within a time interval say 3 hours 4 hours that is decided by the blockchain but after that if you even if a block is generated and accepted even if it is if you want to make it public if it expires from the time interval given by the blockchain then your block is considered as a stale block and it becomes invalid all the transactions that are there in that a block again go back to the memory pool and again have to be mined by some other miner
Another challenge apart from selfish mining and scalability that blockchain has been facing is interoperability. What is interoperability? The major disadvantage with blockchains is that there is no standard protocol uh, to uh, among the blockchains to collaborate and integrate with each other. You can make a transaction from SBI to ICICI. You can make a transaction from HDFC to some Axis Bank. Right. So these uh, uh, interoperability is available in the current uh, scenario, but you cannot make uh, uh, you cannot integrate or collaborate transactions happening in one blockchain to another blockchain because as of now no protocol have evolved the reason one possible reason was that this being the baby of the industry it happened to be evolving very recently as of now no standard protocol is there so because of that reason there is a detrimental impact on the growth of the blockchain industry because if i develop a blockchain my transactions are restricted to my blockchain only i can't use the transactions or i can't verify the transactions of the other blockchain from being a member or being a part of from this blockchain status and although blockchain uh, developers have a freedom to code in different pl programming platforms i just told you in the beginning of the talk that we are using solidity we are using python we are using node.js different uh, 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 platforms are there uh, to write smart contracts and all the things but the problem is uh, these networks are all isolated and they can't interact with each other. You may not believe me, GitHub, which is having the major number of blockchain projects on its network, have around more than 7,000 uh, uh, 7, plus active projects as of now. It is, they are, most of the projects are using different platforms, diverse programming languages, different consensus mechanisms and there is no cross verifiability across the consensus mechanisms different privacy features and all the things and these projects are not able to interact with each other they are not able to collaborate e with each other because there is no standardization again so if you develop a blockchain using some programming language or using some specific uh, uh, blockchain uh, protocol you can't use it in the other blockchain so it becomes again if you want to develop it again you have to use a different protocol or a different uh, scenario in the other blockchain so uh, because of uh, this uh, um, lack of interop uh, interoperability across the blockchains uh, there was detrimental impact on the overall blockchain industry growth another major challenge in blockchains is energy consumption energy consumption is that as i told you one major loss that we have with respect to blockchains comes from that proof of work where massive amount of energy and power are consumed leaving extreme carbon footprints on the world map so uh, the coal-fired power plants from china are providing lots of fuel for the bitcoin network and there is a lot of pollution in those areas with respect to power, with respect to the power and the energy that they consume. What is the gain that you are having by doing so much excessive amount of proof of work is that you will be calculating that one single nonce which you will be which gets accepted in your proof of work blockchain in the beginning have said that i will eliminate the need of intermediary there is no centralized person you can go for a p2p no transaction charges or, or you say no uh, you know service providing charges and all these things but by eliminating all those charges the charge the cost that you are bearing for this energy consumption is too high so what is a trade off that we can do we want a peer-to-peer -peer network, we want a non-decentralized scenario to do our transactions, but we don't want to pay so much of cost for proof of work. Look for other alternatives in your blockchain infrastructure. Use algorithms like proof of stake, proof of burn, proof of elapsed time where you can consume less energy compared to a proof of work consensus algorithm. Then comes my interesting part, that is the security and privacy issues in blockchain. There are a lot of papers available in literature for these privacy and security issues in blockchain. 
you look at any network not only blockchain when you look at security aspects we refer to these four major terms integrity availability confidentiality and anonymity apart from these things consistency double spending pseudonymity we'll discuss about the majority attack or 51% attack and unlinkability so to start with uh the first thing that we look about is consistency what is what do you mean by consistency what is uh, what does that particular parameter say is that when you are having or when you are maintaining a distributed ledger across the nodes in the network all the nodes are supposed to have the same ledger at the same time but what is it that happens in reality is that there are lot of errors and inconsistencies that happen between ledgers that are hold by different organizations that could be because of the different architectures that these organizations are using or because of the business process that they are following no two organizations use the same business process so when these things are being reflected on the respective ledger it may involve some amount of manual process also thereby leading some inconsistencies between the same ledger so the same ledger if i maintain a copy and if you maintain a copy they are supposed to be the exact replica of each other but in reality there are inconsistencies between the same replicas also so what is it that you want do you want eventual consistency or do you want strong consistency what is the difference let us see eventual consistency is the trade off that you pay between availability and consistency i agree that our ledger has to be consistent at all the time but more than that your ledger has to be available at all times what do you mean by availability availability means system availability as well as transaction availability data availability so if your data is not available there is no way that people start using your blockchains in enterprise scenarios application scenarios imagine amazon server going down for 5 10 minutes imagine facebook server going down for 10 minutes it becomes a such a viral news that everyone starts talking about people will not be able to bear that loss of 10 minutes on not using facebook at all so availability is such a serious criteria so you have to decide whether it is availability that you want or consistency that you want it depends on our application certain applications have availability as a major criteria whereas certain um, applications have consistency as a major i uh, am criteria so why is it that we need to look into is that when a block gets uh, propagated to other nodes in the network it will take certain amount of time for this propagation because there can be propagation delay there can be net network delay even it is propagated properly it need it needs time to get updated in the blockchain and before it was updated or before it was appended and if someone reads from a, a replica which is not yet updated they will get a stale data or what you call old data so the key challenge here in eventual consistency is that how do you remove that inconsistency that occurs because of this stale data you make your network network uh, available but still ensure that your, the data that was read by the users is not stale anymore apart from that eventual consistency we have something known as straight uh, strong consistency the goal of strong uh, consistency is to achieve a trade off between availability and cost but not consistency what do you mean by that here all the nodes will have same ledger at the same time in eventual consistency all nodes may not have the same ledger at the same time but the data is available sometimes it can be stale but in strong consistency we can't take that risk all nodes should have same ledger at the same time and any data that you update with a new new data or a read write request they have to wait until the commit happens on your on your blockchain and while your data was being committed you cannot have access to the stale data 
so it is more a uh, performance issue where you have to look at the uh, performance cost because maintaining your blockchain up to date at every given single point of time doesn't come free of cost for us so we have to decide in our own application if you are trying to apply blockchains for a particular scenario what is it that you want eventual consistency or strong consistency if it is uh, medical data i prefer strong consistency but if you are using your data for um, if you are using your blockchain for public social service scenarios eventual consistency should be fine so depending on our application what type of what level of consistency that we achieve can be decided everyone can dream of strong, strong consistency but uh, you know when you look at uh, any any application that you look at in computer science if you try to achieve the highest it will cost you the more you want more storage it will cost you more you want more um, uh, high accuracy high throughput that will cost you uh, in some or the other way availability is another challenge issue when we are talking about availability it is system data uh, sorry it is a system availability as well as data availability users whoever are using the blockchain they should be able to access the data of the transactions at any time from any place so you can't say in these times blockchain is not available or in these locations blockchain is not available once you say that it is a decentralized and public ledger it should be available anytime anyway and when i am saying about availability we refer them at both system level and transaction level then comes the another security issue which is integrity there are certain privacy security issues which are achieved by blockchain and there are certain security issues which blockchain lacks integrity is something which which uh, deals with the, the integrity of the data that was stored as transactions in blockchain what will happen is that when the miners when they attempt to tamper with the information available on the transaction what is it that happen is that they can change the address of the transaction to himself there is a transaction of 100 dollars from uh, user a to user b right if i am the miner and if i see the transaction because i collect all transactions to form a block and if i am greedy i can change uh, from a to instead of a to b i can change it from a to myself right we that is possible i can change it to myself but blockchain will not allow it because blockchain have uh, used sha256 algorithm to verify the integrity of the transactions because of this thing it is impossible to find a similar uh, hash value that matches from uh, whatever hash value that was there for the transaction from a to b i have to find a matching hash value from a to myself if at all i have to modify it and sha256 will not allow you to find such a value that is a collision resistance property of sha256 and then uh, because of the signature algorithm that is used in uh, bitcoins ecdsa the unforgeability also will not allow you to forge a transaction because of these reasons integrity is always stays intact in blockchain and your uh, blockchain is always tamper resistant so it is impossible to modify any historical data that is available on the blockchain so given integrity as a parameter you don't have much research direction to proceed it do not go in that direction because it is already achieved in blockchains with the sha256 and ecdsc so the next privacy issue is about double spending there is lot of work happening with respect to double spending uh, attacks on blockchains what is it that happens in double spending is that same digital cash can be spent more than once so the digital file with respect to a coin can be duplicated then be falsified replicated and all these things can happen so how can you avoid double spending what we do in bitcoin blockchains is that you will have to combine the transactions and uh, sign them with the, your respect to digital signatures when when these transactions are being verified by the miners they come to a majority consensus when they are verifying the transaction so this majority consensus ensures that a particular user will not be able to spend the same coin twice it it is resistant to double spending attack also 
despite resist being resistant to double spending attacks people are inventing new techniques um, to have double spending attacks on blockchains what is it that uh, that happens in double chain uh, double spending is that i have 100 dollars with me or i have 100 rupees with me i try to spend 100 rupees uh, with respect to user a as well as user b so basically i have 100 rupees but i am trying to spend 200 rupees 100 on user a and 100 and user b the same 100 i'm spending it twice that is the reason we call it as double spending although the digital signatures consensus mechanism are able to verify and uh, uh, giving resistance to these double spending attacks some clever miners they are trying to reduce the time gap between these transactions or uh, before, uh, once the transaction was verified and before it was committed into the blockchain the second transaction was happening and such attacks are there in literature where double spending was happening and some research can go through in that area then the very popular attack that happens on blockchains or that is uh, assumed to happen on blockchain is the 51 percent attack as of now, theoretically, we are saying that blockchain attack is resistant to this uh, majority attack. Where What does this majority attack say is that when a group of miners come together and become uh, a conspiracy, in the sense uh, they come together because they have 51, more than 50% of the computing power. So they require a minimum of 51% of computing power. And if they have that power, they can reverse certain transactions that can happen on the blockchain by illegally transferring bitcoins to various target wallets their own wallets and all so certain genuine transactions also that happened on blockchain can be reversed nullified modified and all these things and uh, how can this happen is that uh, the miners that are there on the blockchain the miners are uh, as of now, I told you they are individual miners, but these miners can come together and work together. And as of now, uh, it was told that 40% of the miners are already coming together and working together. So if some 11 more percent of miners also add to them, that becomes a monopoly. So it becomes a hierarchy and they will decide because they have more mining paper, they will get the hashes they will get the block rewards and everything is controlled by them and other nodes will not have any say on that. Theoretically, people are saying that it is uh, my majority is, attack is an issue. That is the reason Bitcoin blockchain is increasing the difficulty level time to time to ensure this 51 percentage is not happening. Uh, I, as of now, personally have no idea whether finally 51 percent attack will happen on the... It is easy for a 51% attack to happen on permission blockchains. Uh, the reason is that in permission blockchains, you know who the users are. So you can bribe them, you can collude with them in some or the other way and form this 51% majority consent. But in public blockchains, when you don't know how many users are there in the network, forming a majority network is a, a very tough thing I say, but I'll not say it is an impossible thing. And if at all 51% attack forms, uh, if 51% of the mining um, pool comes together, the entire network collapses. So are the blockchains here to stay or not? Only time will tell in what direction uh, this particular uh, uh, work goes and how people can find uh, uh, technologies or how people can find uh, scenarios where you give resistance to this 51% uh, attack. Another major issue is anonymity. When it comes to anonymity, when I'm doing some transactions on the users, disclosing the risk of users, user identity by some intermediaries in the sense when i do a transaction i should my identity should not be revealed i am anonymous user to any other uh, node in the network uh, but i don't say complete anonymity is not possible in use cases rather we call it as a pseudonymity pseudonymity is a state of disguised identity where my identity is masked 
so i don't um, uh, i say i may not be able to trace you but i will not say it is impossible to trace you the reason is that we have many transactions suppose a transaction happens between a sender and receiver it is already available on the blockchain if you look at ethereum it is available on etherscan every transaction is recorded on the ledger with the addresses of public key addresses of sender and receiver the assumption as of now is that this public key address is not traceable to the physical identity of the user but however when the same public key address performs multiple transactions on the same network a simple statistical analysis can relate the users with the transactions i may not relate you to your physical identity but i can relate you saying that this public key address have done the following transactions or this public key have done so many trans uh, this many number of transactions on the blockchain so to de-anonymize the user we have techniques named network analysis address clustering transaction fingerprinting and all these uh, uh, dos attacks to identify who a particular user is or to de-anonymize the user we say user is anonymous but we have techniques to do and uh, de-anonymize the user so the full complete anonymity of a user can be protected by having both pseudonymity and unlinkability pseudonymity is there and unlinkability is not there or unlinkability is there but pseudonymity is not there will not achieve full anonymity we need to look at techniques where uh we can achieve complete anonymity by a combination of these two things the another security parameter is confidentiality so transaction information cannot be accessed by any unauthorized user that is same across any blockchain public permission and all uh in the sense i cannot access a transaction information i can only verify the transaction and the system administrators who are there in the network they cannot disclose any user information to others without his or permission they there are some uh, um, policy agreements that they enter into and even in unexpected situations also they are not supposed to reveal the user data that way they are keeping the transaction information or transaction content private so that the real anonymity of the real identity of the user is still remaining pseudonymous however uh, there are certain uh, techniques that are available where the transaction information can be leaked leading to breach of the uh, confidentiality so when it comes to privacy issues there are two major issues that are addressed in uh, um privacy issues of blockchains not two majorly three issues one is identity privacy other is transaction privacy the third one is smart contract privacy what is identity privacy i want my identity to remain anonymous on the blockchain network right i don't want my identity to be revealed unfortunately already literature have some de-anonymized techniques they are a bit difficult to achieve but people can relate you to certain transactions on the blockchain that is one threat with identity privacy transaction privacy transaction privacy is also a major issue in blockchains where because of the transactions being published on the blockchains they may not know the public key addresses but if there is a transaction for 100 dollars between user a and b we may not know who user a and b is but 100 dollars of transaction was done at so and so point of time can be revealed and with all the statistical techniques that i have told earlier it is possible to figure out how many transactions are uh, happening on the blockchain when you know this is this will really affect when when your blockchain is used in um, stock market and shares where the values fluctuate a lot right suppose a public key address was identified to a particular company and if you find that a particular company is selling its shares or buying more shares that will definitely affect the share uh, market at that point of time you may really don't know who they are and all these things but definitely that will alter the way the business happens 
so that is a transaction privacy and then smart contract privacy smart contract privacy is that nowadays every blockchain is using smart contracts you write a piece of code execute it on the blockchain but if your piece of code that you are writing a smart contract has logical issues bug issues or if it was written with malicious intent that may altogether affect the functionality of the blockchain so smart contract privacy is also another thing that was being uh, taken as a research directive nowadays what are those techniques available uh, to solve these uh, privacy issues uh, in uh, blockchain although confidentiality to some extent is used by some encryption mechanisms in uh, integrity is completely achieved non repetition is also possible because every time you do a transaction you will be doing it by using your signatures so at no point can you uh, uh, undo that confidentiality achieved integrity achieved non repetition is achieved however um, anonymity is not completely achieved privacy as i told have you have issues like uh, identity privacy smart contract privacy and also the other thing is transaction privacy how do i do i just quickly conclude that i have told you these two things identity privacy and transaction privacy as i told in part from these two things we have smart contract privacy what we do is that we try to obfuscate the transaction relationship with help of a mixer what is it that we do generally with the mixer available in the kitchen we keep all the ingredients probably when you switch on the mixer all of them get blended very well right you really can't uh, re, uh, separate them individually suppose say you keep three ingredients you make a juice you make some powder you make some paste after that you really can't uh, undo them or uh, uh, separate them that is what happens in mixing technique also various transactions are mixed together see what happens in transaction privacy they figure out that a transaction happened between user a and user b so what i do i don't make an individual transaction some set of people come together and then uh suppose say instead of user a sending to user b a g f come together and send to b c d assuming this is so when uh, this pool of people send money to the other pool of people uh, they exchange the coins randomly and the uh, ownership of the coins get obfuscated because now when you see the transaction it doesn't individually say a to b instead it says a g f transfers money to bcd so that ownership of the coins are obfuscated and now you really cannot figure out whether a have sent it to d whether a have sent it to b or c so who will do that how come agf come together how come bcd come together then we have some centralized mixing services there are websites where they offer this transaction what is it that we need to do is that you need to register with that website and say i have to make this transaction to this public address and this public address they will collect the money from various uh, users and they do these transactions mix these transactions and do the uh, transactions anonymously but uh, there are again uh, trust issues with such mixing services they may to steal the users assets by not transferring them and all but uh, smart contracts can ensure to get that trust by saying conditional execution so when a condition satisfies automatically mixing service have to transfer them however the disadvantage here is that these mixing services they maintain a log record who have given money to them to whom they want to send the money and all these things and if this log record is preserved for a long amount of time that itself becomes a privacy threat so that is uh, again coming back to square one the other problem with centralized mixing service is a single point of failure so if this particular uh, mixing service or website collapses all the transactions that are invested into it also goes wrong and another thing is that uh, these mixing services charge you very high with their uh, mixing fees so solution for this is we have something known as decentralized mixing services where in decentralized mixing services the rather than one trusted party coming together and mixing our services they have a what you call um, 
an anonymity proxy. So they have a peer to peer network. There, there is untrusted piece will be publishing their transactions. And without the help of a third party, they will be mixing them and making a joint uh, to a joint payment together. So what happens because of this is that that centralized server, which is there in between, uh, you don't need to pay him fee. You don't need to have trust issues with them. There is no single point of failure. It works on a decentralized network, same as blockchain. So it's a blockchain on a blockchain sort of thing. So no mixing fees, more decentralized structure. And because of this decentralized structure, it is more compatible to the blockchain network. And as usual, uh, similar to centralized services, this uh, decentralized mixing services, the malicious nodes will not get any information about transaction relationships. However, the uh, dis, uh, demerits of decentralized mixing services is that uh, communication overhead increases and uh, the attacker may block the mixing processes. They, the centralized server will ensure that the attacker will not block it. But because of the decentralized uh, uh, scenario, there is no ownership that was taken by one single node to take care of these mixing services. And, oh, I'm sorry. So another uh, problem with uh, privacy is about uh, revealing the identity of the user. So what is the solution that is available in the literature is about signatures. We use some techniques known as anonymous signatures. Uh, anonymous signatures are those signatures such as group signatures and ring signatures. As the name says anonymous signature, what does that mean is that any member of a group can sign a message anonymously by using his secret key. Suppose it, uh, there are 37 people in this, uh, say for, our, for the number sake, let us say we have 40 people. So each member, each group will have 10, 10 members and each group will have a group signature. So rather than one single individual, each group have a group signature. I uh, suppose say I am of group A, there are uh, four groups, group A, group B, group C and group D. Each group have 10 members and each 10 members will have uh, a group signature associated with them. So any member from a particular group can sign the group signature using his own secret key. So any member with the group's public key can verify. All other four uh, other group members also can verify and validate the signature. However, the beauty is that they do not know who among the 10 people have signed on that particular message, thereby providing identity privacy. So in literature, there are two signatures uh, that was proposed in blockchains. One is ring signatures. Monero is a block uh, blockchain which uses ring check signatures to identify uh, what you call uh, to uh, to protect the identity privacy my own uh, phd student devidas he have proposed a group signature technique to use for identity privacy in blockchains so why uh, why did we propose group chain uh, group signatures when uh, already ring signatures are available in literature is that in ring signatures, the problem is that uh, when a particular user signs on, from, on behalf of a particular group, if there is some uh, dispute or if there is some issue, you cannot identify who the user is or you cannot, there is no mechanism to reveal who the user is. We have used group signatures by taking up uh, e-auctions as a case study. What happens in e-auction systems is that everybody will bid their uh, their quote and once the auction completes, whoever bids the highest quote will get the respective product. But in ring signatures, if you do the signature using ring signatures, people can identify that the message came from so and so group, but they don't know from whom the particular uh, message was message has come so if you use it in scenarios such as e-auction systems we may not be able to retrieve the person who have done the highest bid that is the reason we have proposed something known as group signatures where in group signatures you 
at the beginning you sign using the group signature so people will verify and say this particular message has come from certain group but when the auction has completed group signature mechanism will allow you to identify who who have given that particular signature so as of now in literature group signatures and ring signatures are available um, to deal with identity privacy the other uh, problem with the ring signatures is the size of the transaction size of transactions are very large and it becomes uh, difficult to do auditing when we are using those ring signatures another technique to ensure confidentiality is homomorphic encryption ethereum uses homomorphic encryption um, ethereum smart contracts will be using homomorphic encryption what is homomorphic encryption is that if you keep the data as it is on blockchain people will know the data or people will reveal the information on the data so that will causes privacy issues so what we do we do something known as we do encrypted um, encrypted data on the network but if we keep encrypted data on the network people will not be able to verify it validate it or do anything with that data it becomes a nonsensical data and people will not be able to relate that data so to solve that problem we keep we use a technique known as homomorphic encryption where rather than keeping normal encrypted data we keep homomorphic encrypted data what does homomorphic encrypted data ensures is that the operations that are performed on the homomorphic encrypted data when you decrypt the computed results they will generate the same results as you have performed on this plain text in the sense if i perform a search operation on the encrypted data whatever results i get will be the same once you decrypt it so there is literally no difference between the plain text and the homomorphic encrypted data when you do certain operations so data on the blockchain will be en uh, encrypted that addresses privacy concerns but you are able to audit your data and your data is ready for access as of now ethereum smart contracts have already started using or are already using homomorphic uh, encryption for privacy another thing that uh, another uh, phd student of mine was working on is on attribute based encryption where uh, we are working uh, to use attribute based encryption to achieve privacy in blockchains where uh, when we give my attributes attribute can be anything uh, it can be your identity it can be your aadhar number it can be your pan number anything when uh, you give these attributes uh, act as regulating factors and when you give these attributes they match with the attributes of the cipher text but the problem we are facing in attribute based encryption or for that matter we are not actually working on attribute based uh, encryption we are working on identity based encryption where we try we we'll later point we we'll, we are planning to generalize it to go for attribute based encryption but right now the problem that we are facing here is to deal with the key escrow problem of identity based encryption then multi party computation is another technique which is available in literature where in multi party computation what is it that you do is that this protocol whatever computation protocol that you suggest that there are many multi party computation protocols available in literature they allow the users to carry out some computation jointly over different private inputs and um, uh, so and when an adversary tries to learn something from that particular transaction or from that uh, computation he will not be able to learn anything from the authentic party except the output so basically that is providing both transaction privacy and uh identity privacy for the users uh, this multi party computations uh, there are number of papers where people are using various multi party techniques uh, in blockchain to protect both uh, transaction privacy as well as smart contract privacy so they are doing uh, joint computations only thing is that they are a bit complex to carry out another interesting technique security technique people are using probably i guess uh, last or last but one from my talk is uh, zkps zero knowledge proofs 
what is zero knowledge proof it is a cryptographic technology where it has very nice pri privacy preserving properties as the name says zero knowledge proof what does it do is that uh, see suppose say i want to deal with double spending problem i want to do, make a transaction of 80 rupees when my balance is 100 rupees okay or i want to make a transaction of 120 rupees when my balance is 100 rupees now the verifier need to verify the balance from my account but that is a privacy issue i don't want to display the balance of my account to every miner that is there in the network so what i try to do here in um, uh, zero knowledge proof is that i prove to the verifier without leaking any information from my account balance i convince him that i have sufficient balance so that is what uh, zero knowledge proofs do certifier can prove himself to the verifier with zero knowledge i am not sharing any knowledge and no interaction that is non interactive zero knowledge proofs we also have interactive zero knowledge proofs but in blockchains we use non interactive zero knowledge proofs without interaction we prove to the verifier that i have sufficient balance for my money transfer uh, but how is it achieved we share some common reference string and there are various uh, non-interactive zero knowledge proof protocols available the one that is very popularly used in uh, blockchains is known as zk snark which stands for zero knowledge second non-interactive argument of knowledge there is no no interaction between the certifier and verifier but still the certifier proves to the verifier that he has sufficient balance in his account basically used to verify transactions while at the same time protecting the privacy of the user then we have uh, trusted execution environment and game based environments where trusted execution environment ensures you an isolate environment to uh, save uh, to run your uh, smart contract thereby protecting your um, privacy of your smart contract game based smart contracts rather than revealing the logic of your uh, smart contract you keep that uh, smart contract verification as a game and you ask the users to play the game so based on the various cases that they run while playing the game that will verify whether your smart contract has bugs or not whether the task was performed correctly or not so these are the various solutions available in literature for various things but as of now you know despite these solutions do you think blockchains have no security issues and no privacy issues no that is not the case for that matter uh, which among the which techniques uh, i have almost told you some 10 techniques right we have anonymous signatures we have zero knowledge interaction protocols uh, we have small, you know uh, trust executed environments and then we have homomorphic encryption with so many techniques available in literature uh, uh, do you think we are self-sufficient now to execute or to run blockchain safely no my conclusion here in the talk after all these techniques is security is a myth you take blockchains as a pl platform you take distributed systems unique computer networks anywhere whatever um, uh, security techniques that you try to impose attackers always come with some or the other new technique to overcome that so it is a never-ending game you propose something they try to attack it again you defend it and again they attack it so as of now these are the things in literature a lot of work is going in terms of privacy 